Hello, everyone. There we go. OK, it's, I know it's after lunch. There's been a lot of good information so far today, but we're going to need a little more out of you for this next hour um, if we want to uh, keep having some fun today. So um, welcome to the session. Welcome, everybody here. Uh, welcome, folks uh, watching uh, online or uh, throughout the, uh, the, the conference hall. I apologize. The room only holds so many people, and it's great to see that everybody got nice and close together to uh, pack it in as best we could. My name is Jay Schmelzer. I'm one of the directors of program management uh, inside the Developer Tools Group Developer Division at Microsoft. Uh, my team specifically is responsible for a number of things, uh, including the tooling in Visual Studio for building um, cloud applications, Azure Office 365, uh, as well as .NET, uh, specifically the .NET runtime, the, the framework libraries, as well as the programming languages uh, that's on top of that, so C Sharp, F Sharp, and Visual Basic.NET. Uh, and that's the part of my brain and body and team that we're going to talk about here uh, for the next hour. We had a number of exciting um, announcements and conversations this morning in the keynote with Scott. I want to take this opportunity to go just another little level deeper and give you a little bit more uh, view into the breadth of what we are doing uh, with .NET 2015. Uh, and then kind of give you some pointers off into some other sessions throughout the rest of the conference uh, where you can go even that next level deeper. Try to do a combination of slides and demos uh, to keep it interesting, to keep everybody kind of awake and engaged. Uh, I do like to make these interactive as you can for a big group. Uh, I think that what was going to work best for us here is if you see something you're really excited about, it is not going to offend me or my teammates that are watching on the stream if you applaud and cheer. Um, so feel free to do that. Uh, hey, that's great. We, we're only on the title slide, and we already got applause. Uh, if there's something that, uh, that you're not really excited about, uh, feel free to grab me afterwards out somewhere else. Um, no. Definitely want to hear that, too. Uh, of course, the evaluation is actually a good way to, to, to let us know what you think as well. So what I want to start with is just a some context on what we're trying to accomplish with .NET in the next release. Um, first, let's talk about what it is we hear from you, um, our customers, the developers building applications with .NET. Uh, what are the things that are on your mind? One of the great aspects of my, my position and my job, um, what my team does, is we get the opportunity to go out and talk to and engage with a lot of developers um, all around the world in lots of different industries. And there really are four main things that tend to pop out as consistent themes across all of those conversations. The first is the fact that software uh, is becoming, and technology it's, in general, is becoming an increasingly important part of every single business. Uh, we like to talk about the fact, you know, use phrases like, you know, every company is, a, is becoming a software company. Regardless of what it is you do, software is an important aspect of your business of enabling your business to transform and grow um, in this new environment. That's awesome for us as developers. It's a great time to be a developer because it means our role and our impact is extremely important. It also means that the business has increasing requirements on us. They want new solutions. They want them faster. So time to market is very important. We need to innovate and deliver very quickly. Oh, and they want those applications to run on all different kinds of devices. Um, whether it's you know, phones, slates, um, PCs, big screen, um, you know, wall-sized devices, and they don't, so they don't have the same form factor, and they don't have the same operating systems running underneath them. Um, so we need to be able to go and deliver these rapid solutions for our customers, for your customers, regardless of different device type. The other key theme that we hear a lot is that to keep up with this innovation and to keep up with the demands that we have, we really need to think about how does open source fit into our application development strategy. I'll talk a little bit later um, during the session about how it's influencing what we do um, at Microsoft and what we do in the .NET team. But it's also a, a theme we hear from all of our, a lot of our customers that they're really thinking about how does open source play into their application development strategy going forward? How do they take advantage of the rapid innovation that's happening uh, in the open source world? And the last one, of course, is very important as well. The idea that while all of this new stuff is great, and as application developers, we love learning new things. We love you know, being challenged with new types of, of applications and new um, platforms and things that we need to go target. We also have applications that exist today that run the business. We have existing code that needs to continue working. We need to keep maintaining, um, evolving, and modernizing in a lot of ways. And that's also something that's very core 
um, to how we think about things. Uh, last year when I was here, I shared that you know, we had something like over 1.4 billion um, PCs, p billion machines that were actively taking updates to the .NET framework um, just via the Windows update mechanism. That's an awesome number from an application developer's perspective because it, it shows the target you have of the audience that you can go after. It's a scary number from my perspective because that's you know, 1.4, 1.6 billion machines that I gotta make sure I don't break when we release new versions of the .NET framework. And that's something we take um, very, very seriously. So those are four themes that we've heard um, when we go out and, and engage and get to talk to people. Um, they really then turn around and influence three main things we're trying to do with .NET and the way we think about .NET going forward. Um, that is really you know, the theme around, of course, continuing the innovation, continuing to ensure that we are developing and creating the capabilities in the .NET framework and the .NET runtime that you need as application developers to meet your needs, and we're doing it in the time frame you want. How does open source play into um, the way we build our software and the way we enable our, you know, the .NET framework to grow and expand beyond even what my team can do? And of course, how do we allow you as .NET developers to be able to take those skills that you have, and in a lot of cases, the code that you have, um, and use it to, to go into and build the applications your customers are asking for, regardless of what um, device or operating system they're running on, whether that be a device form factor or a server, server form factor. I believe this, this morning in the keynote, Scott mentioned the phrase, you know, every developer, Scott and such, we're talking about every developer in every app. That is really a core underlying theme for us, an underlying motivation we want to go into and really think about how do we enable the tools and the frameworks that we are creating inside of Microsoft to be applicable to every developer building every kind of application, which means regardless of what kind of device and what kind of form factor they're working on. So those are the main themes um, that we're thinking about. Is that a good set of stuff to think about? Yeah, heads nodding, good. So when we think about .NET 2015, um, we really think about it from a couple different perspectives. Um, there's a set of, we typically refer to them as application workloads, or types of applications that people are trying to build um, with technologies that are coming from the .NET framework. So, you know, WPF for, for desktop applications, Windows forms for Windows desktop applications, and so forth. We have a, a framework that sits underneath that, and we, in 2015, are really kind of introducing parallel streams of a .NET framework in that you have .NET Framework 4.6, which is the evolution, and we'll talk more about what we've done there, the evolution of our, the framework as you know it today. The, the full, you know, there's one instance of it on the machine. When you upgrade that instance of the framework, all applications running on are now running on the new version of the framework. And then we have the new .NET Core 5 um, framework that is designed from the beginning to think about um, cloud-optimized scenarios, more modular and granular and composable scenarios, allowing you to pull in just the components of the framework you want, just the components of the runtimes you need, allow them to run side by side and be isolated to the application. This is also the aspect that we are targeting for our cross-platform work that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so when we bring up cross-platform, you know, Core 5 and ASP.NET 5, we'll be able to run that um, and take, care, take advantage of all these capabilities, but also run it on Windows, Linux, or Mac. And underneath, we have a set of shared investments that we make that apply across the board. Things like our compiler technologies that I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes around you know, the upgrading and the, and the creation of the new version of the .NET compilers for C Sharp and Visual Basic. A new set of uh, improvements and in innovations to the base class libraries, whether that be things like you know, enhancing the cryptography stack to be start supporting more modern um, cryptography solutions and security solutions, runtime enhancements to the underlying CLR around the garbage collector, around our just-in-time compiler um, to continue innovating and make um, improvements there to, in to ensure that all of your applications just get better um, with new versions of the framework. So let's start and talk a little bit about 4.6 four and, and the framework 4.6 and some of the things we're doing there. Framework 4.6 is another highly compatible in-place upgrade to the .NET Framework. So it's a member of the 4.0 family, 4.x family of the .NET Framework. Um, I won't read the entire slide to you, but you, you can think about the, the innovations and the things we were working on here were first ensuring that we continue to be and continue to increase the level of compatibility from framework version to framework version. 
we're supporting the full breadth of that .NET API stack here. So whether you're building an ASP.NET 5 application targeting Core 5 or targeting 4.6, it will run across both of those frameworks. This is also where we're going and making investments in the, the stacks that you use on the desktop. So in WPF, um, even in Windows Forms, we're looking at how do we go and, and do the kinds of things in those stacks that you need us to do around performance, around stability, um, fixing those things so they work better in modern processor architectures and modern um, form factor types. So that's really what we think about uh, when we think about 4.6. This will be another one of those releases that we will uh, make available and push uh, via the update mechanisms that we have available to us. We dive in a little bit more specifically. One of the things that I, I want to spend a few minutes and talk about is WPF. Um, there's lots of conversations that happen. I, I hear all kinds of things about WPF. Um, WPF is the presentation stack for the Windows desktop that we encourage people to use for classic desktop scenarios. Um, things where you know that you need like a, a, a form factor that is much more around you know, keyboard and mice and, and heavy data entry and heavy visualization, WPF is still a great place um, to be building those solutions. Our investments here really center around performance and reliability first and foremost, fixing some of the top issues that have been reported uh, the team recently went back and looked at all of the issues, for example, that came through the connect mechanism, the, the ability for you know, custom reported issues to come through. Anything that had at least 10 votes was automatically reactivated for investigation. Um, I believe somewhere close to four-fifths of those, at least, are already in target to be fixed before um, 4.6 actually releases um, as in its final RTM state. A couple examples here that you know, we point out of specific things where you really, you know, you just need the, the WPF team to go in and make the investment are around supporting more modern um, device form factors or device types, so things like high DPI. Um, you can, it's kind of hard to demonstrate improvements in high DPI because it either looks good or it doesn't. Um, <laughs> we try to take, try to use a little bit of a, of a visualization here, but what you can kind of see in that in that image that's in the center of the slide, you see that the, the combo box is getting chopped off and things like that in a high DPI resolution. With the fixes that have gone into WPF, um, it now renders the way you expect it to. It now renders properly and completely. The other area of investment that we've done around WPF is in the tooling experience. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, I believe strongly in is that um, as, a, as a developer using .NET, your experience is the combination of the runtime the framework libraries, and the tools. And so going and making investments in WPF and in the tooling experiences around WPF um, to, to give WPF developers a more productive experience. So bringing you know, new blend capabilities um, into Visual Studio. We've re-implemented the language service behind XAML um, to take advantage of Roslyn and give you know, higher fidelity, faster, and more reliable um, uh, experiences and interactions inside of Visual Studio. The debugging experience, we've brought a, basically the tools that we developed for um, customers using XAML to build Windows Store applications and brought them over to WPF as well. So now you have the breadth of those capabilities. Oh, I heard a yell, so that's good. All right, you guys are gonna have to, I mean, the poor guy yelled all on his own for that. All right, there we go. We got many now. Um, and of course, diagnostics as well. One of the things that, you know, obviously um, WPF is a very rich visualization technology. Um, so bringing things like timeline debuggers and timeline tools into the experience so you can really see um, where you, the time is being spent in your application and help you hone in on exactly where the fix is um, that you need to make. Okay, so we've talked for a few minutes. Let's uh, switch over and take a look at a quick demo. So we'll switch over to machine number five. And what I have here is just a simple WPF application running in um, the latest version of Visual Studio. This is the release candidate of Visual Studio 2015. Let's go ahead and start it. What you see is I, I'm going to have a simple project tracker application. Now, the first thing you'll notice is you already see some of those diagnostic tools kicking in. Um, and we have memory um, utilization showing up. We have, um, you know, uh, CPU utilization, all those kinds of tools are now kind of coming into the experience um, inside of Visual Studio. So if I bring my application back up, we'll see that, you know, it's just a little kind of 
extremely fancy project tracking um, application. And one of the things I can do is go in and, and enter time. And if we look at this, um, the rich visualizations that you can do with, with WPF are very much, uh, you have the same challenges that you used to have or you have when you're doing really rich HTML and JavaScript and CSS stuff. You kind of get in that mode of where in the world did that thing render from, right? What actually was it that, it, that created that element or, or how did that get that way? So one of the things we did was we brought in the, the same selection kind of technology that we introduced in HTML and JavaScript to WPF. So now while my application is running, I can go over to Visual Studio and I have a live visual tree here and I can go select the selection tool, switch back to my application, and now Oh, that's, you guys must already know what's coming next, because then when I go and actually select an element, what it'll do is it'll automatically sync it to the live tree. So now when I switch back over to Visual Studio, we see that it's gone through and it's actually found that element, right, and the full visual tree of what's being rendered there. In this case, if I wanted to go through and say, what I really want to do is go change the, the border of that, of the, the button itself, I can come in here, keep, leveraging the live property explorer that's also hooked up to the running application, I can just come in, I can say, let's go ahead and just reset that brush. Did I do it? Yep. And we'll go create a new one. So let's go in and create a new border brush. We'll specify that we want it to be white. Now when I select that and set it and switch over to my application, you'll see that the border of my button has now changed live while I'm going through and debugging and working with my application. Lots, lots more things there um, that we could, we could talk about and do. Um, we've got a session later this, later this week. Um, one of the members of the team is, will be doing that, so I don't want to steal all of his thunder. Um, but I encourage you, if you're a WPF developer, um, go check that out. I think it's on Friday. So that's just a little view of some of the things we're doing um, inside of uh, the, the XAML experience for, um, for WPF developers. OK. so. Let's talk about the next, another example of some of those things that happen um, not only in framework 4.6, but also will start extending into the new versions, uh, you know, the .NET Core area. And that's some of the core things that we go um, and work on and do. I want to spend a few minutes and just talk a little bit about um, the .NET compiler platform, or what everybody affectionately refers to it as Roslyn, um, the Roslyn project. I lost that naming battle a couple years ago. Um, so code name wins. For those of you that aren't familiar with Roslyn, this is the something that we've been working on for a couple few years now. And really, there were two aspects for, of it that are, I think are really important and really three uses that will then go and, and manifest themselves for, for all of you as, as .NET developers. The reason we did it, well, there's, a, there's one aspect which, as a language person, uh, when you can say that your compiler compiled your compiler, so your language compiler was implemented in the language itself. That's a milestone for any programming language. So Roslyn is implemented in the Roslyn C# -sharp compiler is implemented in C# -sharp, and the Visual Basic.NET compiler is implemented in Visual Basic.NET. So that's just a fun thing that, as language geeks, we get to say. More important, the motivation was to go and, and enable and, and expose the intimate knowledge that a compiler has of your application out into through a set of APIs for tooling vendors and, and others to use and take advantage of. So we use it inside of Visual Studio to provide richer experiences in the editor um, and inside of Visual Studio itself. We use it outside of Visual Studio to provide rich experiences for code navigation and code exploration. Um, our partners use it uh, to build their tools um, in a more productive way and, and get richer information. And organizations, development organizations, are using it as well to take advantage of that knowledge and codify and have um, best practices and design rules and guidelines that they have inside their organization so that the IDE is now helping developers implement code the way they want to, follow the, the coding practices they want, and so forth. So it, inside of my organization, one of the things that we've done um, as part of the Azure Tooling Group is we've taken advantage of the Roslyn APIs to create a set of guidance that when you're doing an application targeting Azure will detect anti-patterns, essentially, of the bad design patterns for the cloud. 
Uh, maybe you're using a, a local configuration file versus an Azure configuration setting. Um, and flag those for you right within the development environment and offer fixes, code fixes for you right in the environment uh, so you can go and implement your application in the best way. Other organizations, um, as much as we all like to believe we build our frameworks and our APIs to where you don't need special rules for how to call them and how to use them, um, that doesn't always happen. Uh, so we see people, um, and we've engaged with a number of people that, that create these um, code-aware frameworks that we like to refer to them as, where as part of bringing in that assembly, bringing in that library, we can also bring in a tooling package that helps you use it properly or flag improper uses. And you can get that live while you're writing code in the editor. You can invoke it via build tasks, um, so it can run as part of CI and, and CD um, implementations as you're doing check-ins and stuff like that. And just really allow the compiler and the tools to help you write better code. As a customer, as a developer, you know, there's really three uses that this is going to happen. First, you're going to see us be able to go and innovate faster in both the language and the IDE, because we'll be working in a much more productive environment of, of managed code versus the old C++ environment that we used to do the compilers in. Um, and, we didn't have, and we can share the, the semantics of the application and, and the knowledge one way, so we can implement tools inside of Visual Studio once and let them work across both C Sharp and Visual Basic, rather than having to do everything twice. So that gives us the ability to innovate faster, gives our, our partners and you as, as developers the ability to go um, and extend Visual Studio in more new and interesting ways. It doesn't have to only happen within Visual Studio. The compiler and the Roslyn APIs can be used outside the IDE as well. Um, so we have some examples of things uh, where we've implemented things behind a website. Um, if you're familiar with the reference source for the .NET framework, there's a website, reference source, um, that allows you to go and browse the source code of the .NET framework. Behind it, we have Roslyn providing us information to get you even richer navigation capabilities based on the types and stuff like that. So you have the kinds of things you would expect only in IDE, but in a browser-based experience. And of course, the third aspect is the fact that uh, last year, OK, last year in a week, I think, because maybe the build was a week earlier last year, we announced that we were open sourcing the Roslyn project. Um, since then, we've also moved it to GitHub. And so we're now doing the work on Roslyn um, in, in the open as part of an open source project, taking contributions from the community, does a couple things. First, it, it allows you to understand and see and learn how we've implemented things. You can debug through things if you're trying to do extensions and see how it works. You can contribute back in um, if you have suggestions or, or want to help us with, um, with bug fixes or feature implementations. Um, so if you've always wanted to know how people do things in a compiler or how Microsoft did it for C Sharp, um, you can now go do that. Kind of transitioning on a little bit, so let's start talking a little bit more about how we think about um, .NET Framework and the, some of the other application types that people are trying to build. This morning in the keynote, we, um, Terry spent a fair amount of time talking about kind of the universal Windows platform. Uh, and that's obviously a place that we're investing quite a bit with them from the .NET side to allow application developers to build applications that run on this new universal Windows platform the, the ability to create a single binary that can run across all the different form factors that Windows runs on, from Raspberry Pi through an Xbox. Um, the ability to go and, and also tailor those experiences based on the form factor and device type, so you can do things appropriate for the different form factors as well. As part of that, this is also where we've brought in um, the .NET native technology. So we started talking about this last year, Essentially, .NET Native is one of the things that allows us to, to address a top ask, which is allow me to, to write my, to get the productivity of C Sharp or Visual Basic .NET as a developer, but end up with the same kind of executable that a C++ developer would have. So .NET Native allows us to do exactly that. You do your development in C Sharp or Visual Basic .NET, calling all the framework APIs, um, do your same rich debugging experience and so forth. When you're building a universal application and you switch from debug to retail, so you do your actual final compilation, we extend the compiler tool chain and add in um, essentially the backend C++ compiler. So we go from the intermediate language to a native binary 
um, a native image at the end using the same C++ backend compiler that you would use if you were a C++ developer. As a result, you get much faster startup time because NGen doesn't happen, um, and JIT doesn't happen as part of your application startup. You have a, a flavor of side-by-side -side that now starts coming with these applications because we have statically linked in the libraries that you used as part of your application into, that, into your application. So now you have your copies of those things, um, and you're not subject to you know, someone picking up a new library and suddenly updating your application version. Um, so that's all just kind of great core capabilities that you can take advantage of um, as a .NET developer building for the, you know, the universal Windows platform. As we mentioned last year, one of the common questions we got is what about the other application types? Uh, we're starting with the universal, uh, the universal Windows platform. You gotta get that one right first, and then we'll go look at what the next places are we should take it. You can imagine that things like console applications are the next logical candidate, um, and then we'll continue from there. That was a quiet applause. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of Framework 4.6, WPF, that's some core things around Rosalind, that's, that's how we think about you know, supporting the, the universal Windows platform. Now let's start talking a little bit about how we think about the other devices that are out there. Um, so one of the things that um, we're really excited about, we've been excited about this for a number of years, is our partnership with the folks at Xamarin, um, which allows us as .NET developers to take our C-sharp skills and our .NET understanding and apply it to building native iOS and Android applications. We get 100% access to the underlying APIs that are available in iOS and Android, uh, and then Xamarin also continues to evolve that experience and add additional higher level you know, abstractions. So things like Xamarin Forms start allowing us to go and build UI once that can run across all those different devices, but still allowing us to get at that underlying API so that when and if we need it, we have the actual you know, underlying platform specific API available to us to do what we need to do um, and get those rich kind of uh, native experiences. One of the great things that's come since you know, over the last probably, within the last 12 months from, from the Xamarin experience is a new set of UI designers in Visual Studio when working with um, C Sharp and .NET to build iOS and Android applications. So you now have a visual design experience inside Visual Studio to go and, and create your UI. So you get more of a drag and drop experience for designing your UI rather than just a code centric experience um, that you used to have. So let's take a look, just a real quick look um, at what that experience looks like. Let me log back into my machine. So what I have here is um, running, I'm switched over to my Mac, uh, and I have Visual Studio running um, inside a Parallels environment. And I apologize, it's a little bit small, but what you can see here is I've actually got a fairly large and complex application here. It's a universal application, so it actually has you know, uh, a Windows sort of um, store kind of experience, a modern experience. It has a phone application. It also, way up here, even has a WPF desktop application. And then an Android and an iOS application is part of it. And then what we've done is by, because I'm using C Sharp and .NET and, and the Xamarin um, technologies, I'm able to share a lot of the code across all of those application types. Um, so I can share a lot of my business logic, a lot of my core, you know, how do I connect to and talk to the services that are driving my application from one spot across all of those different applications. I don't have to go and rewrite everything um, in all three different ways. And if my network is happy and everything is feeling good, when we just go ahead and F5 this, what we'll see is that we can now go and get a, a rich you know, emulation and debugging experience from when, within Visual Studio um, into the iOS uh, phone simulator running on my Mac. And there we go. Sorry, it was faster than I expected. Um, actually, that was way fast. That's totally what I expect. I completely expected that kind of performance. Um, but so he here you see, we're just getting a, you know, a list of, this is like, if you saw our Connect event back in November, this application was part of a suite of things we did there where um, you know, just sort of like a, a private shuttle service for an organization. Um, so we can see a list of things. We can see the cars that are available and, and where they're at, those kinds of interesting things. Now, 
if I wanted to, I could go and do the same thing, um, switching over and flipping to the, the Android application to be the startup, um, F5ing that as well, and then we'd see the application come up inside of the Android emulator, um, running, running very similar UI, very similar capabilities, do the same thing for Windows, um, and so forth. But given, the, uh, given our time right now, and that I have a donut spinning, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll leave that to the sessions later in the week to dive into this in a lot more detail. Okay, so that's kind of the, the world of the desktop and devices. Now let's talk about the web and web services and the cloud a bit. Um, one of the other big, big things that, is, that we've been investing in this year and as part of the, the .NET 2015 product wave is the next version of ASP.NET. We refer to it as ASP.NET 5. So this, is a, this is an ASP.NET, a cloud, you know, a web stack that was designed from the beginning with the cloud in mind and cloud application patterns in mind, you know, patterns like microservices and things like that. So thinking about how do we create, how do we, de how do we ensure we're designing a framework, a web framework, that is lean, fast, simple, composable, modular, allows you to go and do and bring in just what you need. Get a small footprint of the application itself. Turns out that folks hosting web applications care about the footprint um, of your application. Happens to be in a division that runs a very large cloud service that cares a lot about the size and how much we can pack onto machines. So it's really thinking about how do we allow you to only bring in what you needed and what you're taking advantage of. Performance, ensuring that you get the throughput and scale that you need um, to serve those cloud needs. And then also thinking about the tooling experiences and ensuring that we're, we, while we're making it more modular and giving you more choice, more options, we keep the productivity that you've come to know and love as an ASP.NET developer. I'll show you a quick demo of this in a second, but I think there is one important thing to, to think about, and, and I'm sure that Scott and Scott, when they do their session later in, uh, in the week and dive into more details, we'll talk about this quite a bit. But you know, ASP.NET 5 is, is a framework, is a web framework that runs on both .NET 4.6 as well as the new .NET Core 5. And the majority of the capabilities that are new, the things that people are excited about and that we think you as developers will be excited about, are available in both, right? So the modularity, the cloud design point, um, modern compiler architectures, faster development, iteration cycles are all across both of those, regardless of where you run it. If you want full side-by-side -side from the runtime up through the, the framework stack, um, those kinds of things only are going to be available on .NET Core 5 because that's the runtime that is available to be side-by-side. -side. Um, so Scott and Scott like to blame it on me that because Core 5 is the only one that can be side-by-side, -side, uh, that's why the limitation exists there. So let's switch over and take a little look at um, just some aspects of the ASP.NET 5 uh, experience. So we'll switch over here. Let's go and just do, let's go ahead and do a file new. And we will choose web. Now one of the first things you'll notice is that in the, the latest version of Visual Studio, we've extended the one ASP.NET dialog to now also include those ASP.NET 5 templates. So we can create you know, an ASP.NET 5 website um, and allow Visual Studio to go in and pull in a sort of a, a starting recipe of modules and components that you probably would want to use to create your ASP.NET 5 application. Again, it is entirely modular. You can remove any of this. We just tried to, to keep a product experience by giving you what we thought were the most common modules that people would want to pull together. Now, one of the first things you're going to notice here is we've moved to the project is all now package-based. It's all now based on NuGet packages. Um, so you'll see that one of the first things it's doing is it's restoring the packages um, on my machine for this application. If I go in and expand the references node, what you'll see is now rather than a long list of assembly references, we see a set of packages. And packages can compose, them, can compose on top of themselves. So packages can consist of packages, um, which consist of packages, uh, and so forth. So we can go and get really granular with how um, this works. And one of the other things that 
kind of we've done as a result of this, or part of what feeds into this, is also ensuring that um, we're making it easier for, as we think about how ASP.NET 5 is going to be available cross-platform, and we think about tools like you saw this morning with Visual Studio Code, or experiences that are not Visual Studio for building your web application, we also wanted to ensure that the, the project structure and the system underneath was going to be respectful of that. So if we were to go through and look at something like, you know, the, oops, not package, sorry, wrong one. The equivalent of the project file, this project.json file, you'll see that it's just a textual file in JSON format that describes the, the packages, the, the references, the components and dependencies of your application. Now what I can do here, let's go, let's go expand um, the, that node real quick. And you'll see that one of the things that we've got in here is this you know, ASP.NET um, cookie-based authentication package in here. So if I was to just go in here, pull that out, save it, you see that it's, Visual Studio has detected that, hey, someone edited that, removed that dependency, so Visual Studio will just go and update itself as well and remove it, right? So if you're working with you know, another developer on, on the team and one of you is using Visual Studio and one of you is not, as you're changing those things, you know, you're not fighting with each other with, oh, you need to update the project file so that, which this other guy didn't care about anyway because he's over hanging out on his Mac with Sublime Text or whatever he's doing. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it. That's great. <laughs> if I add it back in, we'll see that again, Visual Studio's picked that up, and it's going to go refresh the package and pull that dependency back in and, and live update the, the references tree and the dependency tree inside the product. Kind of cool? Let's look at another aspect that I think is, is, is pretty neat and compelling. And again, it's, it kind of goes into um, how we enable a better workflow between um, developers. So I'm going to first go, and I'm just going to do a start without debugging. Um, and this is going to go and fire up the application. The first thing I want to show you, once the application comes up, just so you know it's real. If I go back over here and kind of say, hey, let's go open www.root inside of Explorer, right? And let's go into bin, and what do you see? Or more importantly, what do you not see? There's really nothing there, right? Um, and that's because now ASP.NET 5 allows us to take advantage of the Roslyn compiler and do dynamic compilation in memory of your application, right? It turns out that we get a huge startup performance boost out of this because writing that stuff to disk just takes time, right? So we can go and just update it automatically, compile it in memory, keep it in memory, and serve out those requests. Now, of course, you can still go do compilation if you want to. Um, and if you do F5 to debug, you will see assemblies because the debugger needs those things on disk to be able to work with them. But in this case, we're just using an in-memory compilation of, the, of the, the site. What that means is that if I was to go in here and let's say you know, I look at a page, and I decide, you know what, I'm just gonna, I wanna go edit this. So let's go say, rather than, you know, about, let's say, you know, hello, build 2015. I'm just gonna save that. I'll flip back over here, and when I go to the about page, you see that it's picked it up, right? Because, Because the, the, the process recognized, hey, uh, you know, a component changed. Um, we need to do, do recompilation of that piece of the site and serve it up. So I didn't have to go restart the browser, didn't do any of those kinds of things. Really, I think, a powerful capability to really help us as web developers be more productive and more iterative. You don't have to go and keep constantly restarting and stopping. Also allows tools like Visual Studio Code right, to play nicely in this environment where they can just go and edit files um, and the, the changes are, are reflected right away um, inside of your running application. Again, that's a really, really, really simple look at kind of what some of the things going on and some of the aspects of ASP.NET 5. Uh, the, the Scots, or as they like to refer, oops, wrong one. You don't want to see that. Um, the, or like they refer to themselves, the lesser Scots. Uh, we'll go into more depth uh, tomorrow, and then I think actually 
uh, Scott Henselman and um, some other folks are going to go do an even deeper dive later. So if you're a web developer, I encourage you to, to go check those out. So I want to kind of talk just for a second about you know, the way we think about cross-platform. Um, there really are two aspects of this. I showed you earlier how we think about, um, and through our partnership with Xamarin, we provide C Sharp and .NET developers the ability to do cross-platform development in the mobile world, so targeting Windows, iOS, and Android, um, still using your C Sharp skills, still using your, D your .NET framework familiarity, producing native applications um, for those devices. Back in November, we announced that uh, we were taking the new .NET Core and ASP.NET 5, and we're taking it cross-platform to run not only on Windows, but Linux and the Mac operating system. This morning, you saw another demo um, of some of that running um, an ASP.NET 5 application in, inside of a Docker container on Linux, debugging it. You saw in the modules window in the debugger that unlike in November when we announced it, and we were built doing that on top of Mono, and you saw a bunch of Mono assemblies in there, which still works just great, um, we actually now have the Microsoft implementation of the .NET Core running um, in those environments. Later this week, Habib from the, from the team is going to do a deeper dive into how we build those things and show you more examples of stuff. But I couldn't resist, and I kind of wanted to show you something fun. Um, so let's switch back over to my machine. And I want to show you a little bit of .NET Core running on Linux. Oh, you guys don't need to see that. I am going to get in so much trouble. Rumor is my wife is actually watching the live stream. She has no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but if you clap, then she might think I'm cool or something. I don't know. <laughs> now I'm definitely in trouble. Um, you guys are great. So what I have here is an Ubuntu um, image, a Linux VM running here on my Windows machine. Um, and I've got you know, .NET Core 5 installed on it. Now let me just do this so you get a, oops, let me get out of there. Let me do this real quick so you can get a little bit better view of it. So first of all, what does .NET look like sitting on a Windows machine? I mean, on a Linux machine. Uh, click back in. Well, there it is. It's just sitting, you know, it's kind of ex-copy deployed with your application, so it, it it is a side-by-side -side implementation. It's just going to be deployed right next to it um, all the way. Now, what I, what I want to do here is I've got a simple little application that I created. Let's go. So what we'll do is, um, hello, get back in. Let's do, um, let's just run. You saw a little bit of this this morning, but here's just the, the Hello World version of .NET Core running on Linux. Now, we don't have a UI stack, so it's just ASCII art. So here's kind of .NET saying hello to the Windows world running from Linux. Now, yeah. But I said, we support Windows, we support Linux. And we support Mac. <laughs> now you might be asking yourself, what does that code look like? Well. What I'm showing you here, let's go do this so that, is probably the most uninteresting bit of C-sharp code you're ever going to see in your life. <laughs> because it's exactly what you would expect to write, right? It's exactly what you would have expected to write to do this kind of hello world thing before. It's just now running, compiling, and executing um, in a Linux environment. So really just trying to drive home the fact that, you know, if you scroll down, you can even see we cheated. Um, in the sense that uh, not all this stuff 
you know, the Windows one's pretty easy. We did ourselves a favor, made our logos really easy. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, you get the idea. So um, really just kind of showing a little bit of, of a simple hello world. Now, I promised Habib I wouldn't steal all of his thunder. So tomorrow, I believe, Habib's got a session. We'll dive deeper into this, and he'll show you more about building an ASP.NET 5 application, accessing data, the ability to, to from a .NET application running on Linux, call a SQL database running in Azure, right, through ADO.NET. So the things that you expect will be there. I will say that one of the things that we are excited about, Scott, can't believe Scott Guthrie stole my thunder this morning, but um, yes, we do finally have binary previews of these things available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. It is a preview. It's an early preview. It is not the final product. It is not the final API surface area. It's an early preview. Um, did you guys hear it's an early preview? <laughs> so there are places that are very thin threads um, through the full stack. But hey, we brought .NET up on Linux and, and Mac OS in about six months. Um, that's pretty good. Um, so we've talked about kind of the 4.6 the framework. We've talked about the improvements we've done there and the way we think about that. We've talked about the core .NET Core 5, and how we think about that. And we've talked about applications on devices, um, web-based applications, and we've talked about cross-platform. The last thing I wanted to touch on was that aspect of open source and how we think about open source and the way it's changing um, the way we build and deliver software. Um, back in November, we announced, we made the announcement that we were going to do this. Uh, you, as a developer community, had a response that I will say was uh, phenomenal. Um, you beat my expectations of, of excitement. Uh, I love this one because it just sort of shows that in places like Hacker News that, in case you never noticed, aren't typically Microsoft.net friendly places, uh, we trended to the top. The other th reason I like this, this, happen this snapshot is that um, there were other things going on in the world the day we announced, like landing on a comet. <laughs> but apparently, as a developer, uh, .NET being cross-platform is much more important and more real than landing on a comet. So that's great. And I just want to say thank you um, to everyone that is, is following and paying attention and engaging with us um, in this space. The, well, I'll talk about that in a second. The, the other aspect that I wanted to touch on was something we announced last year at Build, which was the creation of a new .NET Foundation, a place where we wanted to, to foster, encourage, um, and support open source development around .NET technologies, whether that be the .NET core implementations and the, the core stack that we have there. So as of uh, earlier this year, back in February, there was a point in time where uh, in February, about, I believe about the middle of February, you actually had the full .NET Core 5 stack, runtime, core framework, compilers, ASP.NET, and Entity Framework were all sitting open source in GitHub being actively developed. So that the full stack showed up in those GitHub repositories uh, in the middle of February. The .NET Foundation is just over a year old now. Uh, we started very slowly, very intentional to, to ensure that we were engaging with the community, doing things in the right way, uh, maybe a little slower than we intended to, but we've picking up steam. We've got a number of great projects that have come into the foundation. Uh, earlier, last, earlier this month, we announced that we, we brought on a full-time executive director. Uh, many of you in the, in the .NET world or definitely the, uh, the application lifecycle world or the, the Git and, and kind of Visual Studio working with Java world will know Martin Woodward, who is our executive director now from the .NET Foundation. Very excited um, about that. Really looking to engage with folks um, on those projects. Just to give you a little sense of what this has done, kind of the result that um, we've seen as a part of this, the things that we're trying to do with the foundation, really create a place that's going to be 
awesome and facilitate rapid innovation for both kind of the general open source community, but also folks with commercial interests. So ensuring that the projects that we bring in have licenses and licensing models that are favorable to both you know, the open source and the open source with commercial intent um, mindset. Being a place where we can bring together experts and folks that are knowledgeable in how to do this and have a lot of experience to help people that are new in the open source world get engaged, figure out how to start a project. Um, when you have an idea, like how, how we can bring people in to help you figure out how to, to get it set up, get people aware of it, get people engaged in it. As a person that's just new to open source as an individual, opportunities to help you think about ways to engage um, in that experience. We've, got, we've seen just amazing um, reactions, amazing contributions coming into the core framework, the core runtime. Uh, we open sourced the core runtime. The Windows implementation there was there. Little stubs of the Linux and Mac um, abstraction layers were there. Members of the community contributed in a pull request that had pretty much the Mac PAL implemented. Um, the team looked at that and was like, whoa, what? this person's got a lot of time. Um, <laughs> turns out had some time, but just wicked smarts as well. Um, and so really meaningful, impactful contributions are coming in, and we love that. Uh, we're seeing how it's changing the way the team is operating. So they've gone from just you know, the code being open to really thinking about how to design and work in the open. Uh, if, you're in, if you're a C-sharp developer and are interested in how we are thinking about designing the next version of C-sharp, you'll see that that is happening on GitHub. The language design meetings are being posted there. We're having threads of conversations with, the, with you, the C-sharp um, developer, on how we should think about that thing. Once the team does a better job of behaving nicely with each other, we'll probably even do live design meetings. Um, just kidding, they're all awesome people. Uh, the, the framework team is doing live, you know, recorded and live API design reviews, right? And the, the feedback and the comments we see are like, wow, I actually, I always thought that there were people that, that spent hours discussing and debating whether adding one argument or one new overload would be good or bad for a class. And there are, right? And now I understand why they care so deeply and how they think about those things. We've seen developers, obviously they're contributing in, but we've also seen developers that are participating in the repositories to learn and to become better developers. Turns out if you submit a pull request into the framework, obviously we're gonna code review it, and we're gonna give you feedback, right? And you're just gonna get code reviewed by the same experts that have been building that for forever, right? And so we see people going, wow, this is great. I'm, I'm able to go and engage with you know, these people that, have, that understand exactly all the trade-offs of how to implement something um, in a high-scale framework or in a um, performant framework, and I can bring those back into my organization and learn. Uh, for, I was, had the opportunity to talk to some students a couple, I guess a month or so ago, um, and one of the things we talked about there was that we're starting, you know, no surprise to people that worked in the open source world, but we're also starting to see how your contributions to open source projects are really becoming the more interesting part of your resume as a developer. Right? So rather than ask you a goofy coding question and say stand up on a whiteboard and try to, to write it out, we can look at what you're doing. You can, you know, you can contribute in and, and actually have your work speak to your skill set. And that's a really interesting thing, I think, as a developer to think about um, you know, how you, you take advantage of these opportunities to continue to grow yourself. And that's a, you know, a thing we see across the industry. So that's something that really has picked up steam in the last you know, I'd say six months is the work going on um, there. It's really changed the way um, the organization works. Uh, I made the joke last month that, or last year that, uh, you know, when we, when we open source Roslyn, the team realized all of a sudden that, you know, going from the five people down the hall that were gonna code review a check-in to, wow, anybody following the repo was gonna look at the check-in. Now they actually see that there are thousands of people following their repos, and you could, you could say that they're a little more motivated to ensure they really did finish what they were said they were gonna do when they checked it in. Um, I will say another thing we've been trying, so those of you looking to engage, we've started posting um, what we refer to as up for grabs work items. So things that we know are on the backlog that we want to do or that have come in from the community that we feel, yeah, these are right in line with what we wanna do. We just sort of flag them as, there's no one from the team working on this right now, so if you wanna grab it, this is a good place to start, right? Um, so just trying to come up with creative ways to to engage with you. 
If you have other ideas, we'd love to hear them. So kind of bringing it back, that's, that's how those three core ideas, those three core themes that we've been pushing on for this release are really starting to manifest themselves. Hopefully you, you agree that um, you know, the, the innovation is happening. Hopefully you're excited about the cross-platform aspects of this. Um, and hopefully you're, you're excited about the fact that we're doing this in a more open um, environment, um, that we can engage with you. Um, it is a two-way engagement. Um, really you know, looking forward to, to more and more folks getting in and, and, and working with us on those kinds of things. This is just the how quickly could I pull together a few things when I got a hold of the schedule this morning and, and give you ideas of where else to go. My goal here wasn't to go and make you the experts in everything that we're doing. It was really just to give you a, a broader view of what is happening in, in .NET in the next release. Hopefully give you some ideas of things you want to go take advantage of and look at um, and, and sit in on or watch in a recorded style from later this week. So this is a small set. Um, definitely, if you're an ASP.NET developer, I encourage you to go to those first two. Uh, the XAML tools deep dive will be um, pretty amazing with, with Uni um, on Friday as well. And then uh, Dustin and Mads will be talking quite a bit about what's new in C Sharp, um, how to take advantage of the, the Roslyn project to build extensions um, and build great experiences for yourself, um, whether that's something you want to sell uh, into a tools ecosystem or just something you want to create for your own organization um, to help you and your development teams um, be better and be more productive. With that, you have been a phenomenal audience. So in my evaluation, you guys are awesome. You're getting top scores. Um, <laughs> definitely appreciate um, evaluations. Uh, they, we, they really do help us understand. Um, just remember the, the numbers, those are for my boss. The comments, those are for me. Um, nah, just kidding. Um, please tell us what you feel. We've got three minutes, so if there are a question or two, uh, we have some mics in the middle aisle if you want to jump up. Um, otherwise, I thank you for your time today. I encourage you to take advantage of the content as well as just the networking opportunities the rest of the week here at Build, uh, and go build some great .NET apps. Thanks. <laughs>